Hi everyone, we're about to begin. Just hang in there. I'm waiting for a few more persons to join us and then we'll begin the class. So good evening to you all. I give you everything.
Evening, everyone. I think we need to start um, the class. It's getting on, and not everyone has joined us, but we will need to uh, move forward. And hopefully, those who are coming a little bit later on will be able to just join in and catch up to where we are. And if you are just coming in now, just Rewind if you're going to be having to step away. You can always pause it and it's just that like you'll miss the live interaction. If you have to ask a question, just understand that if you're not live or following the live feed, then your question might actually not get to me while I'm on air. So if you have any interactions, any questions to ask, comments, anything, feel free to um, just drop it in the chat section. And just as a reminder, uh, we are taking a register for the class, a role, and so we ask that you indicate in the, in the chat your name if you're just joining us so that we can go ahead and make a note of your presence in the class. This will become very important toward the end when we make our special offer. All right, so... As we are about to begin, let us actually shift over to the title for the class. And the title for the class is The Seven Keys to Getting and Staying Well the seven keys to getting and staying well. Now, it's very important for persons to recognize that as we are dealing with this topic, There will be questions that people will have. Please feel free to share them in the chat. 
you may have thoughts or ideas that come to mind, share those as well. Because if we can learn from each other, we will definitely benefit maximally. So, and I'll try my best not to be controversial tonight. There's a lot swimming around in my head and I don't want to necessarily get off topic because I still will have to get home after the class is finished. What was interesting was during the time that we had the lockdowns and I would have these classes here at the office and I would have to make my way home thereafter. Um, you know, it's, it was an interesting time. It was an interesting time. And hopefully those who are watching the class are watching it from the comforts of their own home. All right, so shall we begin? The information for the office is there, our phone number, bearing in mind the last five digits are represented. The area code is 876 for those who are outside of Jamaica. Just remember the area code is 876. And whether you're in Jamaica or not, 10 digit, 10 digit dialing is in effect. So the area code must be included with the number. I suppose at some point I should go ahead and change this. In fact, I wonder if I can just change it now before I forget to do so later on. There you go. See, there we have it. How easy was that? So, the seven keys to getting and staying well. It's important that persons and I realize the value of thinking in a manner that is more health-oriented than illness-oriented. And the question is, what determines how we think? What determines the likelihood that someone will have a wellness mindset versus someone will have a, an illness mindset? What is illness? What is wellness? So we're going to touch on some of these things, right? The important thing to note as we are dealing with um, these things, I had shared a link up above. So somewhere over by the chat section there to my far left, you will see um, the link there. Just click on the link to the Google Drive folder so you can access the file and download the, the handout that goes to the class. Actually, this is a handout that did not come filled in, and the one that is in the link is filled in already. So you, all you have to do is just follow along. You don't have to fill in anything. So I hope that works for you. If you do not have the ability to just click on the link in the chat, but you do have a QR code reader on your mobile device, just scan the QR code and you will be able to, you'll be taken directly to the um, file where you can download it or just view it, whichever makes you happy. So in dealing with the seven keys to getting and staying well, obviously we have to, whatever we do has to make sense and we have to do it in, a, in an orderly fashion. And so as we deal with the orders of things, the first key is understanding the difference between sick care and health care. Understanding the difference between sick care and health care. Hi, Loletta, how are you? Welcome to our class. Please make sure that you download the handout by clicking the link above in the chat. I'm going to actually pin the link and I'll Let's see here. Good. So I have pinned that message so that anyone who comes on can just click and see the class. So nice letter. Good to see that you are present. Okay. So let's continue. So understanding the difference between sick care and healthcare is important to being able to navigate at least this this lecture and navigating the whole healthcare system. Now, many people have a faulty understanding or appreciation of what the healthcare system offers, what they're good at and what they're not good at. And obviously, if somebody has a 
contrary viewpoint, you know, you're welcome to share it respectfully in the chat. And I emphasize respectfully. Because nothing I'm going to share here is intended to insult or, you know, debase anyone or any group. Having said that, the healthcare system is not focused on optimizing anyone's health. We need to understand this. The healthcare system has two primary goals. The first is to save lives. The second is to ease suffering. Now, if somebody has pain of some sort, obviously that, that's suffering. If somebody has a disease that is interfering with their quality of lives, that too will constitute suffering. And so the way the system is designed, it's in a way to try to ease that suffering, reduce the amount of suffering. And so if somebody has a disease, there are two ways to ease their suffering. One is to get rid of the disease, fix the problem. And the other way is just to hide the symptoms so that the person is not experiencing the negative effects of having, having the disease. When we understand that the majority of diseases that exist cannot be cured by traditional methods, traditional medicine, then we can understand why it is that all we're seeing as an interest is just easing suffering by way of um, reducing the expression of symptoms. Now, reducing symptoms does have a value. I mean, if somebody is ailing and they have symptoms that's interfering with their lives, Easing the symptoms will help them to get back to life a little bit easier. However, we're not just talking about feeling better for the short term. We're talking about getting well or getting better for the long term. And that's very important. And we're going to see that in a minute. But the problem with the healthcare system is that it caters to sick people primarily. And so the systems around it are geared toward how we can improve the health situation for a sick person. So everything is about sickness. And so when we say sick care, we're talking about caring for the sick, which is the standard or traditional healthcare system versus true healthcare, which is more geared at helping people to optimize their level of health, achieving the highest possible level of health for that individual in that moment in time. So when we look at the sick care um, system, healthcare, in quotations. The sick care system is reactive. And what do we mean by reactive? By reactive, we mean that something has to go wrong first, and then after this thing that has gone wrong, then we try to act. And this is important. Something goes wrong first, and then persons will act in response. Hi, Paulette. Good evening. Make sure you download the the handout for the lecture. All right. All right, so do that for me. So sick care is reactive. Now, reactive means that we're waiting for something to go wrong before we act. However, if we want to have a chance of achieving true health care or true health, we need a system that doesn't just wait or we need an approach that doesn't just wait on things to go wrong first before it kicks in. We want to do things in anticipation of what can go wrong so as to preempt what can go wrong and prevent what can go wrong. And so this is why we look at the true approach to healthcare in a very different light. And whereas sick care is reactive, true healthcare is proactive. We have to do something before anything goes wrong to prevent it from going wrong in the first place. Now, according to this third bullet, it asks a very important question. And this is a question I want to ask you. Are we in a healthcare crisis? Are we in a healthcare crisis? Yay or nay? Who says that we're in a healthcare crisis? Don't raise your hands. We can't see you. But you can indicate in the chat. But one of the things, one of the reasons we say that there is a healthcare crisis is simply because the 
there's the one is the cost, the cost of healthcare. People are spending more and more for healthcare now than in the past and are getting less in return. What kind of system is that? A system where you're spending more but getting less. That system is a system that's designed in a flawed way or is destined to fail. Either the design is flawed or the destiny is failure or both. And so we want to understand that we can't simply be spending more and getting less. There has to be something that we're getting for what we're spending. And the problem is that the focus of the system, especially as, as it relates to um, a lot of health departments all over the world, is one of trying to find a means of making drugs and surgeries more accessible to persons. But here's a problem. We can't solve the current cause of ill health by having more drugs or surgeries. So what is the current cause of ill health? Who knows what is the main thing that causes poor health? Is it something that requires drugs? Is, is it lack of drugs that's the cause of ill health? Is it a lack of surgeries that is the cause of ill health? Or is the cause of ill health um, lifestyle choices that we make? And I suggest to you that lifestyle choices is the main cause of the healthcare crisis that we're in. We have a pandemic of diseases. We have a pandemic of diabetes. We have a pandemic of hypertension. We have a pandemic of high cholesterol, heart disease. We have so many things that are pandemic and we never hear these things talked about on TV that much. Why is that? Well, that's because there's no solution for it in mainstream medicine. Now, the medications that are offered, if you have a circulation problem, there are medications that are offered for it. If you have diabetes, there are medications that are offered for it. If you have um, high cholesterol, there are medications that are offered for it. But these medications do not ever fix the cause of these problems because it doesn't even try to ask what the cause is. It just tries to override our physiology to achieve a number in a particular range. That's not good. So we will always have a crisis because we can never solve our lifestyle problems with more drugs and surgery. And that is, as we say, fact. So if we want to change our behavior, the way we, the choices that we make, the way we do things, well, then we have to change the way we think. It's very difficult to change behavior by will. It's much easier to change, change behavior by a, a change in mindset. So having a new mindset is a much better driver than having a will to change something. And so we talk about adjusting our thinking because the way we think, our mindset, is what determines our actions and our attitudes. So when we look at the two ways that people think, we think in accordance to two models, the illness care model and the wellness care model. The illness care model on, my, on the left or right of the screen and the wellness care model on the left of the screen are the two ways that we think. Who teaches us how to think in accordance to the illness care model? Who teaches us how to think that way? Well, the people who teach us are the people who are selling us products that, will, that, that mindset suits. And so you find that we learn about the illness way of thinking from the pharmaceutical industry. They are the ones that tell us how to think in a sickness model so that our decisions will support that industry. And so what is a sickness way of thinking? And let's talk about this really quickly because I want people to understand. The difference between the two, and so we'll begin. The, the, the first way that people think in a sickness model is this. If they have some ailment, the first thought they have is, what can I take in order to feel better? And I even have patients that come here 
They come here, they, they know I don't give medication, um, but they come here and they ask questions like, so we do an examination, we find out what's, what is likely to be going on, and then we schedule them to come back so we can go over everything, make a plan to address their situation, and then they ask the question, but doc, me in pain now, you can't give me anything to feel a little better or to ease the pain. And the problem with that approach is what most people don't know, and that an attempt to ease the pain using medication almost always exchanges one problem for another. In fact, almost any disease that you have for which you're using medication to solve it almost always exchanges one problem for another health problem. We call these other health problems side effects, but a side effect is just a different effect from what is desired. It doesn't mean that it's a lesser effect or less likely to cause harm. It's just a different, different effect from what is desired. And so taking things to feel better cannot be our goal. We need to ask a higher level question. And the only way to ask a higher level question is to think at a different level. And the way we want people to think is in accordance to the wellness care model. And that is, if you have an issue, the first thought you should have is, what do I need to do? What do I need to change? What do I need to have in order to get better? Not taking to feel better, but actually changing to become better. We want to improve our health so that whatever it is that's causing the problem will go away itself. And sometimes by just making this approach or taking this approach, the things that are wrong can go away almost completely by themselves without any need for any foreign intervention, as it were. Just a little change in behavior. The next approach is this notion of getting well. So persons might be in a hospital, they might be sick, and somebody comes to visit them, and the first thing that the person says or the first card that the person writes or the first note that they bring or the balloon that they send or the flowers or whatever it is will almost always say, get well soon. You see, in this paradigm, the notion of wellness becomes more of a wish, a hope, a desire, a dream. For some, it's a pipe dream, but it's a dream nonetheless. And the downside to having this as a dream and not anything concrete is that it's not concrete and it doesn't confer upon the person any measure of improved wellness or improved health. In fact, I mean, the way we want to look at these things is what can we do to really make a difference? And just simply wishing for people to get well does not make a difference. Now, if we want to get an improve or have an improvement, yes, wellness is a, is a desire, but wellness is not the goal. Or wellness is not, cannot become now the, the target, so to speak. Wellness is about the journey. Wellness is not about the destination. Let me repeat that. Wellness is about the journey. Wellness is not about the destination. So if it is that you have an issue and you want to change something in your life in order to improve your situation, having your goal being wellness as the end goal, when I'm well, that's, that's when I know I have arrived, is a dangerous approach. Because if that's what you're thinking, then if you ever were to achieve it, then you're going to slow down. You're going to stop running. You're going to stop trying. Which person... Having a goal be wellness as opposed to the journey being wellness is like an athlete running around a track. Let's say it is a 1,500-meter race. A 1,500-meter race is three full times around the track and plus a 300-meter or three-quarter um, lap. A three-quarter lap is 300 meters on a 400-meter track the athletes will have to pass the finish line four times. 
four times they had to pass the finish line. The fourth time that they passed the finish line, they would have covered 1,500 meters. The goal is to run 1,500 meters. If the goal is to run 1,500 meters, what happens when they pass the finish line the last time? They stop. Why? Because they have reached their goal. This is how we are programmed. When we have a goal in mind, once we've achieved that goal, we stop. We either stop trying, we either lose heart, we either give up, we either, whatever it is, we stop running, we stop trying. And that's the danger of the notion of getting well. Wellness is a journey. And if our goal is to enjoy the journey, then we enjoy the journey as long as we could possibly enjoy the journey. If instead of running 1,500 meters, we're just going for a run. And if we're just going for a run, some people just go for a run to enjoy the fresh air and the breeze and whatever. And it's not about the time. They just want to go out and do a little run to feel a little good about themselves. And that's what they do. It's about the journey. And so when we talk about wellness in the same way, rather than simply looking at it from getting well, which is the destination, we want to think about it in terms of the journey, which is staying well. How do we stay on the course of achieving wellness? How do we stay on the course of achieving good health? It's about staying well. And not only that, the notion of staying well also suggests that we have to do whatever we're doing on an ongoing basis. We don't just do it for a short term. We do it ongoingly. We do it whether it's raining, whether it is sunny, no matter what's happening, we are on this journey. We are on a course. Now, I'm a vegan. I've been a vegan now um, for about the duration of COVID being around. I think I started in November before COVID hit. And I've noticed that it's not difficult for me to maintain my vegan lifestyle, except that in Jamaica, it's not easy to find restaurants that serve uh, a vegan meal. So if you want to go out and have a meal with somebody, it's hard to find it sometimes. But for me, I didn't go into this, go onto this path to say, I want to lose 10 pounds or I want to lose 20 pounds or I want to lose 100 pounds. Because if that is your goal, then that's what you're going to fixate your mind on. And then when you've achieved it, you're either going to have to find a new goal or you're going to stop working. And this is what happens to a lot of people. They want to lose 100 pounds and they go on this intense diet. When they get to 90 pounds and they look, they see that things are going well, they feel good. When they get to the 100 pounds, many of them slack off afterwards. And the things that they did to get them to that point no longer will work because they no longer do it. We want to be about the journey. All right? I hope this makes sense. All right, spending a lot of time on this one. Let's move on now because I really want us to look at the last one, which is staying alive. The measuring stick that a lot of people use to determine how long we are alive is, or to measure how well we're doing in terms of health is how long we live. And so we say, well, if we have, if this society has more old people than this other society, then they're doing better in terms of healthcare or in terms of health. And longevity and health Though they are related, longevity does not mean good health, and good health does not mean longevity. There are many people who are fa fairly healthy, but will die before others who are not very healthy. There are some people who are not healthy by virtue of having some chronic disease, but this chronic disease is not necessarily life-limiting, and so their lifespan is not necessarily shortened. And then there are some people who have no diseases whatsoever. They have excellent health, but then they're in an accident and they die. Or they fall and hit their head and die, or something happens to them to claim their lives. You see, being healthy in that case did not save them. So how long people live is not about how healthy you are. How long people live has more to do with the choices that the Heavenly Father makes or the, the decisions that he will make, <laughs> whether you like it or not. It's his choice. 
But staying alive cannot be the goal. You know what's a more lofty goal than staying alive as a measure of how well a, 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 um, a society is doing as far as health is concerned? It's how people are actually feeling, how well they feel, how well they are doing, the quality of the life. So I would rather be able to enjoy everything that I was able to enjoy 20, 30 years ago in another 30 years. I would love to be able to continue to do that. That means I'm having a very good quality of life. I would not want to say, boy, I'm living to be 90 or 100, and I'm there suffering from a disease that doesn't kill me, but at least I'm suffering. I don't want to be suffering from anything. I want to, be, I want to have a good quality life right up until the time that the Heavenly Father calls me home. So when we look back at it, the subtle shift in our thinking goes from feeling better, getting well, and staying alive, to getting better, staying well, and feeling alive. From feel, get, stay, to get, stay, feel. And that's so important. Now, as we move forward, it's going to go a lot faster now. It's going to go a lot faster now. Now, is pain a good thing or a bad thing? Here's my question to you. Is pain a good thing or a bad thing? And I want to answer in the chats. If you think it's good, say good. If you think it's bad, say bad. If you think it's both, which most people end up saying both so that they can't be entirely wrong. Um, they put both. But the reality is that whether good or bad, we can all agree that pain has a purpose. So what is the purpose of pain? What is the purpose of pain? The purpose of pain is to alert us that something in our bodies has changed. Something is different. Something is not, is not right. And it needs our attention. That is the purpose of pain. That's what pain tells us. Something is off. We need to fix it. That's what pain tells us. The problem is that you can't trust pain to tell you that all the time. Because sometimes, depending on what the problem is, pain will never let you know that something is wrong. Let's look at cancer, for example. Look how many people have cancers. And there's no pain associated with it in the early stages until the cancer has made its way, damaging how many organs and so on, and then you might have pain. Not good. We want to deal with these things in a different way rather than hoping for pain to warn us. So having good health doesn't mean that we're feeling good. And some people, they're feeling good, but there is a problem going on. So simply waiting for pain to tell us that something is wrong is not the best thing. The ideal situation is... If we are able to control the systems of our body, of our bodies, or improve the overall function of all the systems of our bodies, then we have a chance of achieving good health. Because good health is equivalent to healthy function. If our bodies are working right, we will have good health. If our bodies are breaking down in one way or another, whichever way in which it's breaking down is a way in which we are not experiencing good health. And that's so important. So we are to trust the way we feel, sorry, trust the way our bodies work and not the way our bodies feel. Trust function, not feeling. Trust function, not feeling. This is critical. So as we look at it, trusting function, not feeling. We are seeing that there are different um, systems of the body, each system has its own, each system has its own unique set of things that is a part of it. When we look at the cardiovascular system, it has the heart associated and blood vessels. The digestive system has the liver, the stomach, the spleen, the kidneys, the colon, 
as all a part of the digestive, well, not the kidneys, but the colon, as a part of your digestive system because it's a part of digestion and absorption. Our immune system, our nervous system for the brain and spinal cord, musculoskeletal system, the bones and the muscles, the tendons, ligaments, joints, excretory system, which we talked about, the, the, the kidneys and so on, reproductive system for the reproductive organs, all these things are systems of the body that are important systems for the body. And if all of them are to work well, we have to do things to promote their proper function. The best way to do this is with what we choose to eat and put into our bodies. Do not put things into your body that's going to compromise one of your systems. Do not put things into your body that's going to make anything break down. Only put things into your bodies that are actually beneficial for your body in some way. That's if it is that you want to have good health. You can frankly do anything that you want to do that you're comfortable with. It's your choice. Going forward again, we need to talk about this system called the nervous system. Here's a did you know. Did you know that the nervous system is the master control system of the body? And that this system is responsible for regulating and controlling all the other systems of the body. I didn't even know if I don't even know if you're aware. Nervous system is responsible for governing and controlling the function of every other system of your body, whether it is your digestive system, your immune system, um, respiratory system, excretory system, cardiovascular system, skin. Every system of your body is con under the control of the nervous system. And that way, the brain can control what happens to us every way, in every way possible. So as we look at the nervous system, let's check this out. It is the master control system. And one thing to realize is that for the nervous system, there are, let's do something here. The nervous system is the master control system of the body. And that is because the nerves that exit the spine control each of these systems. Or So when you look at it, what you will see is nerves that travel from the brain or spinal cord that goes to every organ, your eyes, your glands, your heart, your lungs, these yellow lines and blue lines all control different areas of the body, different organ systems. And so you find that the brain has a way of communicating with each and telling them what to do. And that's so important. So we say that the nervous system is the master control system of the body. Bones, the nerves that exit the spine has to go between the bones of the spine. And so if the bones of the spine are displaced out of alignment or are turned out of alignment, then the shift or displacement can impact the function of the nerve. And in so doing, can result in the nerve breaking down. So we have to be very careful about what it is that we do and not just the nerve breaking down, if the nerve breaks down, then also whatever organ or whatever system that the body, that that nerve controls will also break down. So we don't take these things lightly. When we have a spinal misalignment, this, the technical term for that is a um, vertebral subluxation. And vertebral subluxations, if they impact the nerve as they're exiting, 
can cause nervous system dysfunction. This is so very important for persons to get. This is something that happens. Bones get shifted out of place. If you're in an accident and an accident can have a force that's large enough to cause a bone to become dislocated, which is completely, the joint becomes separated completely, or can cause a fracture where a bone actually breaks, then clearly a lower force that doesn't necessarily, is not necessarily high enough to cause a fracture it's not necessarily high enough to cause a dislocation, but there might be a low enough force that can shift the bones and cause them to become displaced without a fracture occurring. And this is what we see happening for most people in accidents, who survive accidents especially. Something gets shifted, they're in a car accident, a rear end collision, they get a whiplash injury, a bone in their neck gets out of place. And as it's out of place, we see that the nerves stop firing properly because it's in being interfered with. Over time, whatever it is that that nerve controls is going to suffer as well, and then the person ultimately will start to suffer one of many different maladies. So these are important things. But as we look at it, we want people to start to understand how things are. So when we look at the spine, there might be, if you look at this, here, the third bone down, if you notice, is not lined up with the others. It's not lined up with the others. It is displaced backward. This backward displacement of the bone can impact the nerve as it exits. When the nerve exits, if it's being impacted by a bone out of place, then it can cause various level problems for people. And so these are things that we have to take very, very seriously. Um, this happens in almost, in the vast majority of, of traumas that people experience. Something gets shifted out of place and it doesn't even require the car, if you're in a car accident, it doesn't even require the car to be hit with enough force to cause a dent. Sometimes just a fender bender or bumper to bumper clash is enough to cause a bone to get shifted out of place. And this is what people just don't understand and, and then they take for granted and then they end up suffering the consequences later on. My hope is that we're able to correct these things in persons early enough to prevent disease from setting in. Let's move to the next one, which is understanding that lifestyle stress is also something that causes subluxation. Remember, we talked about a uh, misaligned vertebra can cause sublux subluxation. A uh, subluxation can cause um, stress. Well, now we know that, sorry, a subluxation can cause misalignments. Um, a subluxation can cause distress to the nerve. Uh, stress can cause subluxations to occur. And many people don't see the connection between stress and their function. So there are three types of stresses or three ways that stresses will impact the human frame. One is physical, like a trauma, car accident, fall. The other one is biochemical, things that we are exposed to chemically, things that we put into our bodies, into our mouths, we eat, we drink, we inject, we smell, we taste, whatever it is, these are chemicals. And if you put a dangerous chemical into our bodies, then our bodies will be under stress as a result. So that's biochemical stress. And then psychological stress, which is, uh, you know, the mindset, the mental space that we have. If we are in a good emotional state, these things are all things that can affect the psychology of the individual and cause psychological stress. Now, the healthier our nervous system is, is the better we're able to adapt to any stress in our environment, no matter what the cause is. And so we want to improve our, the, the function of our nervous system. And one of the main ways that we can do that is with chiropractic care. But I want you to understand how it is that stresses can cause a problem for us. Now, our ability to adapt, our ability to adapt, 
is determined by the width of our GAP, the width of our gap. In this case, our GAP is our general adaptive potential. That is our ability to adapt to our environmental stresses. The greater our ability to adapt is the wider our gap would be. The lower we are able to, to, to adapt, the less we are able to adapt, is the narrower our gap would be. And what is this gap? So let's show you how it works. So as we look at it, from a gap analogy perspective, every gap will have a lower limit as well as an upper limit. The space between the two boundaries represents the gap. If your upper limit goes up further, you are approaching vitality, you are approaching optimal health because the wider your gap is, is the more you can adapt to and the healthier you are. The narrower your gap is the closer you approach to death. The narrower your gap is, is the less you can adapt to and the less vital you would be. Now, our upper limit will not stay as high as possible for as long as possible because there is always some external stressor or some environmental stress that attaches itself to our system and reduces our ability to adapt. And we only have resistance and internal resistance to counteract the effect of this external stressor. So external stressors will push down on our upper limit to narrow, narrow our gap. The internal resistance will push up on our, lower, on our limit and help us to cope better. This is our hope that all the experiences of life will exist within the boundaries of our GAP, within the boundaries of our gap. So when we look at our gap, all the experiences of life we are hoping will exist between the two boundaries. And once that happens, once nothing exceeds our ability to adapt to it, then whenever it occurs, we adapt to it. And we do not break down, we do not get sick, we do not falter. But if it exceeds our ability to adapt, then we will break down whenever it happens. And if we allow our upper limit to fall to a level that allows some of our experiences to now exceed that limit, then those things which used to work, which were once fine, now become fine no more. And this is where we start to break down. And so as we look at it, what we do see is upper limit may drop because of the stressor. And wherever you see these targets, that's what's happening. These two have exceeded it. And now it will break down at those levels depending on what the issue is. So, so for some people, it might be diabetes in their family. That is that higher limit there or that higher level there, that once your potential lowers enough, diabetes will manifest. Some families, it is heart disease, and if that upper limit falls low enough, then heart disease will manifest. And for some families, it is diabetes, it is um, cancer. And if it is cancer, then whenever cancer occurs, or whenever that lowers enough, then cancer will occur. So these are very important things to pay, to pay attention to. Chiropractic helps to widen our gap because it improves nervous system function, and that's one of the things that it does. But it's not the only thing. I don't want people to be fooled into thinking that as long as they have a chiropractic adjustment, they're going to be healthy. There are more things than that that you will have to do. In order to maintain good health, it is important, imperative, essential 
that you make wise choices to prevent things from breaking down in the first place. And so, to be able to catch things as early as possible to know whether or not you are having any kind of a spinal issue, rather than waiting for things to go bad, which oftentimes that's what ends up happening. People wait until they have gone bad before they come see us. But we would prefer to be able to assess them to see or assess you to see what's going on. Is there an issue that we need to solve? And so we've invested in technology from the Space Foundation that allows this to happen. The device is called the Insight Subluxation Station. You can always Google it. I know you have a Google culture out there, so you can Google it. But there are two devices that we use as a part of this on the spine. One is a rolling thermal scan. The other one is the surface EMG panels. Surface EMG it measures muscle tension. It can tell whether or not there's a muscle spasm. I hear people are told all the time that they have muscle spasm without any test being done to show that this is so. Well, this device can measure whether there is actually a muscle spasm in your spine. Um, also, the temperature of your skin. You know, sometimes people say that skin feels hot. This is not what we're talking about here. We're not just talking about the actual temperature of the skin overall. We're talking about a comparison in temperature between the left-hand side of the spine and the right-hand side of the spine. No matter what's happening in your body, even if it's a fever, as long as your spine is working properly, then the system on either side will be about the same. The temperature should be balanced. If the temperature is not balanced, then something is off. And this is what we're measuring for. We're measuring for the balance in the temperature. Now, there are many people who say chiropractors are bone doctors, which is completely wrong. A bone doctor is an orthopedic specialist, an orthopedist. Those are the bone doctors. Chiropractors, we work on the spine, yes. The spine is mainly bone, yes. But it's not just bone. So we don't want people to think that it's just about the bones. Sometimes the problem that's causing the issue is a muscle problem. Sometimes the problem causing the issue is a ligament problem. And sometimes it's a chemical problem. And chiropractors, our focus is on the spine, primarily. But we work on other joints as well, no matter what the problem is. Well, it matters what the problem is. But having said that, there are, there's, this is a study that confirms the effect of the spine or the effect of chiropractic on brain function. Because if the brain controls the spine and chiropractors can influence the function of the spine, then chiropractors potentially should be able to influence the function of the brain. So is there any study to prove this? And the answer is yes. So this person was, this lady was given a task to wiggle her left ankle. And as she wiggled the left ankle, you will see areas of activity in the brain showing up as different color lights. Before the adjustment, the lights were everywhere, all over her brain for that simple task of wiggling her left ankle. After the adjustment, the lights were confined to the right-hand side of the brain, which is the side that usually would respond when there's a function on the left-hand side of the body. And not only that, there were fewer areas of lights showing up, which means that this brain on the right is way more efficient than the brain on the left. And that is so important to understand. On the right is, is after the adjustment. On the left is before the adjustment. One adjustment to the lady's neck was able to restore proper communication between her brain and her ankle. And so the ankle function improved with the one adjustment to her neck. Very important. The 
next slide that we're going to look at is understanding my specialty in chiropractic neurology. Chiropractic neurology is a specialty within chiropractic that allows me to be able to work directly with brain issues such as traumatic brain injuries, neurodevelopmental disorders, different things of that sort. Um, I'm also a chiropractor, licensed chiropractor in the state of Texas. And chiropractors are all trained to realign the spine. So yes, that's a part of what I do. We realign the spine. But my training extends beyond that to also include retraining of the brain itself. And we do that through specific exercises and only specific types of issues will respond very well to what we do. Not every issue will respond very well. Some issues respond very well, some respond fairly well, and some don't respond. So here it is that this is a list of some of the conditions that have been treated here at my office. And developmental delays learning challenges, neurobehavioral disorders, neuro deficits, balance or movement disorders, and brain injuries. These are things that can happen over time with different individuals. These are things that we try to help with. Now, our vision is threefold. Our vision is one, to identify subluxations, and that's with the specified, specific tools that we have through the Insight Subluxation Station to measure these things. Two, we provide a program of chiropractic care, which is hopefully appropriate for the individual. And this is one of the things that we do with our information um, gathering. We try to provide a program of care for each person when they come to us. Very important. And we also educate our community. We educate our community, well, I do it in this way, by one, doing the classes that we have. Two, we also have a radio program that we are, we have on the on RGR 94FM or RGR Radio Jamaica 94FM. And these are very important ways. I also do various talks from time to time. I think I'm scheduled to talk, do a talk for the Gleaner tomorrow. Um, but these are all ways that we seek to improve the health of individuals through education, giving information that they'll be able to, help, to, to get. So who's responsible for your health and well-being? Who's responsible for your health and well-being? The answer is we are each responsible for our own health and well-being. We are also responsible for that, the health and well-being of our children or anyone under our care. For some persons, like myself, we are part of what we call the gap generation. And the gap generation kids are the ones who are taking care of both their own children and their aging parents. And so if you have a parent that you're caring for and a child that you're caring for, you're also a part of that generation, gap generation. There are different testimonials on, on my page. I'm going to invite you to turn to our page on um, our channel on YouTube and look through to find our testimonials. There are some on there that are very cool, so you can share it. I try not to post too many on there because... The more testimonials, the more people will come. The more people that come, is the harder it is for us because we're already oversaturated with persons. And it's forcing us to, be, to not be on time with all of our patients, which is really a problem. I'm seeking actively someone to assist us so that we can get to do what we need to do as far as health is concerned. Having said that, feel free to review our page. Now, I had said to you, I had said to you earlier in the beginning of the class that you need to put your name down in the chat section. So let me say that one more time. Please indicate your name in the chat section because that's what's going to be used as our register 
for the class. That's provided that you are part of our patient cohort already, right? Um, whether it's a family member or whatever of a patient. But put your name in the chat so we know you're there. Because there's a very special offer that we are going to make. Anyone who desires not to become a patient, but to be examined so that we can have them set up to becoming a patient, there's a very special offer, but it's only applicable to those who indicate tonight that they are interested in taking up this offer. That's the only thing that you have to do. Just say that you're interested in taking up the offer. You can do that by simply replying in the chat section here or by sending an email to appointments, plural, appointments at gcnjamaica.com. GCN Jamaica.com. So if you make an appointment or you agree to make the appointment tonight, when you do come in, we'll put a note on the record that, so that will let everyone know that... Let me put this back up because I want you to be able to see the screen as well. We will put a note on your, on your ledger when you come in that whoever it is that checks you in, it doesn't matter. They will already know that you're entitled to a 40% discount of your new patient exam when you do come in. That's for those of you who indicate that you're interested. So if you have not yet put your name in the chat, please make sure you go ahead and do so. If you are an existing patient, you will also get a discount. But to qualify for that discount, we have to know that you watched the class as well. So simply write your name in the chat as well, indicating that you are here so that we know to offer you this discount put it on your ledger so that it is there for you whenever you come back to content, uh, continue with your treatments. So for all of our existing patients, you will get a 20% discount off your update exam. So persons who become new patients, meaning that they've already had the new patient exam, they get a 40% discount. The Existing patients will get a 20% discount of their ex update exam. So not only do that, but I have here that they get a 20% discount of one treatment per person that is referred. Um, I think we're going to make a change to that in the near future to just a uh, flat dollar figure to just add to your account to offer you a little bit better savings because we want to make sure that... Um, you know, if you're helping us, we want to make sure things are easier for you. So it's a way that we say thank you. And the last thing is that we also offer a 10% discount off the entire next phase of care. For those who are existing patients that watch the class, they get a 10% discount. So here, the information. So please, take advantage of that, if you will. Just remember to put your name in the chat so we know that you're there. So the, the, the list of things that the ways to contact us or the ways that you can find us, you can find us on the website, at the website, gcnjamaica.com. You can follow us on Facebook at gcnjamaica. Or you can follow us on YouTube by typing in Gardner Chiropractic. If you want to follow our radio program on RJR, we also stream it on Facebook, and you can just simply go to the Facebook page and stream the class or the lecture. It's at Back to Health Talk Show. Back to Health Talk Show. So it's facebook.com forward slash Back to Health Talk Show. And it will take you to the page for the class. Like the page. Become a fan of our page. 
And so you're notified whenever we go live with content. So I hope that helps. I hope it helps. And I'm looking forward to being able to share with you again next month. And I hope that some persons will take up this offer because nothing beats a free offer that saves you money. Nothing beats a free offer that saves you money. Having said that, it's about 7.30 now. I just want to say thank you for spending the time online with us. It was well appreciated. I know there are some people that jumped in and jumped out at various times. We thank all of those who have tuned in and are watching tonight. Um, Loletta, thank you. Paulette, thank you. Beverly, thank you so much. Lorna, thanks as well. Thank you for um, all that you do. Oh, Haldine, if you're still there, thank you as well. And Orette, so these are persons who had indicated in the chat. So I'm about to sign off now. It was good to have been here. And I wish you all the best with everything. <clears throat> have a wonderful night. And do drive safely if you're not at home. <clears throat> and take care of yourselves. <clears throat>